started here. Council study session, August 22nd, 2022, 6 p.m. City Council Chambers, 111 East Maple. And Mr. City Manager, go ahead and start us off on this. Yes, uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, at your regular meeting last week, one of the items was held over at the request of the council uh, to have a study session this evening before reappearing on your next agenda uh, regarding the electric utility service policy. Deputy Director of Independence Power and Light, Joe Hegendeffer, is here to uh, give you a little more detail on uh, staff's proposed recommendation. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor, Council, City Manager. I'm Joe Hegendeffer, the Deputy Director of Independence Power and Light. So at the request, yeah, we'll uh, cover the IPL service policy changes. I know it was kind of daunting. There's a lot of pages in there. There was a lot of verbiage that was changed over. So probably a good idea to just go ahead and cover um, those changes from a high level. And then if you guys have any questions in the specifics or want to dig into the policy, uh, I will try to answer them the best I can. I also brought my planning supervisor with me to who was instrumental in helping make a lot of these changes, so I can uh, definitely phone a friend if I need to at that point. So uh, the last time this policy was changed was 2018. Uh, of course, we've got a lot of new employees. Myself, um, Mr. Jerry Borland as, as well, uh, looking over these policies, hey, do these make sense? What's the industry practices? And we thought it was best to uh, revisit this policy at, the, at that time and institute some changes that are a little more uh, even with the industry. So number one, uh, the big change, and this one instituted a lot of changes through a lot of pages. So instead of us calling out all the specs throughout the policy over and over again, we're gonna reference the NEC or the National Electric Code and the National Electric Safety Code uh, this way, that policy uh, and those guidelines change throughout time, off and on, and this gives us a chance that whenever those change, we aren't automatically out of compliance with the NEC or NESC, uh, and any contractor in town that's following those codes should be aware when those changes come out and allow us to just stay in compliance with that. It also helps uh, cleaner language in, the, in our service policy uh, instead of, like I said, specking out all those different things. How often do those organizations um, make changes? Um, three to four years okay. they make changes. Uh, and sometimes they're very minute and may not affect this policy at all. Uh, and sometimes they're huge revamps of the policy. So The second change uh, is in concern with meter sockets. So IPL used to uh, provide meter sockets for all new installations on houses and commercial. Uh, that's a lot of cost. And to be honest, uh, the meter sockets alone uh, incurred IPL costs of up to about around $35,000 uh, yearly. So instead of us continually providing those, we're gonna make the change that uh, the customer is going to be resp responsible for furnishing and installing those IPL approved sockets. Uh, how many how many sockets are we talking about for thirty five thousand? Annually, <coughs> how many? Three hundred ninety two last year. That's why he's here. Give me those answers real quick. D does he have a breakdown of cost, or do I need to do the math? A breakdown cost yeah. of, of what? So individual. Socket. What's, the what's individual called? sockets range on price. Right. Um, they can go from $100 up to $600, depending upon if well, it's a commercial. Uh, how about or residential? Residential one, on average, I don't know. Around $63, $63 a piece $63. for a residential one. And so, who, who just, I'm sorry, nope. who, who are we buying the bulk of our, our meter sockets from? They're available at a lot of different electrical warehouses around town. I don't know specifically who you we buy. Do you know who the manufacturer is? No. Okay. Because they're, they're pretty generic and they're, pretty, they're available. Well, we have a large manufacturer here in Kansas City, Millbank. Do we buy the bulk of them? Yeah. Millbank. Millbank? Okay. Yeah. 
So we've already right. discussed Sorry. these changes with a lot of the contractors and the vendor warehouses that we use, and uh, their biggest comment was, we're surprised you haven't changed this yet because all of the electrical utilities around us, this is pretty standard practice that they don't provide it anymore. Uh, this way, uh, I guess you could say that development pays for development instead of spreading the cost through all the rate payers. What's a rate payer if he has to provide his own? Um, what What's he going to find the price going to be? Is he going to buy it at Home Depot? Is he going to buy it at Lowe's? You got to go to a specific warehouse. I mean, what's the cost going to be in comparison to what we provide to the rate payer? You want to come up, Jerry? I'll just I'm have sorry. him sit here. I, That's okay. They'll probably end up paying a sales tax on top of the value. Um, and I do know um, from some other places that um, they were end up paying like 75 to 80 bucks um, per each one of them. Um, so our so rate payers are going to pay more to provide what we use to provide for them at, at a better cost. No, not the rate payer, the person actually doing the work. So the contractors. Yes. So the contractors would benefit from our being able to buy a volume. Now they're buying on their own, whatever their pricing is, and they pass it on to the customer. That'd be correct. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions on that? Sorry. Yeah. It's okay. Yeah. That's why we're here, right? To clarify yeah. all these questions and, and get them out. It's okay. I'll wait. You wait? Okay. Number three moves on to temporary service facilities. So when there's a temporary service hookup out at a construction site, uh, IPL used to provide those. A lot of times we would uh, get a phone call, hey, we ran over that, and we would come back and provide the replacement for free. Uh, this is going to change from us providing it to, again, contractors uh, providing those through construction phases. Can I ask um, another question on that? Certainly. So, um, because the third district does have new home construction going on, I know um, builders have to call, get a spot location. Who pays for that? I mean, you, you're charging to come out and do a spot location, correct? I don't think we have in the past, no. No, and we're not going to. So we're to. not charging for we're that? We're not charging for that service, no. Okay. This is purely for the actual devices themselves, the temporary metering hookup. So spot locations are free. There's no charge for any of that. Correct. That gonna are you, you're talking about actually this is where it needs to be located? Well, it could be or new home construction or if, if uh, customers are moving their current box or if their service, you know, changes. Uh, God forbid there's an accident, something that happens. Is there a spot location fee that's charged ever? No. Okay. So along with these changes, we are working with the communications department as well so that it's not just a change and when a contractor comes, they find out. So we want to push out communication probably both through mail, email, and then also have information when people come up for uh, to get a permit. So when a contractor comes to pull a permit for electrical, they have this information available to them as well. Number four is a uh, overhead requirement. Uh, so there's always been a, um, at the director's discretion, the ability to waive the overhead uh, requirement. So this just kind of clarifies that a little bit to allow us to make some sound decisions. Uh, so some examples are if somebody's relocating a meter on their house, in the past we would require them to immediately go underground. Well. Let's say there's no trees in their background, in their in their backyard, and they have to go through 100 feet of rock from the pole. Well, that doesn't make sense to force them to pay that to go underground if it's not going to be any jeopardy to our reliability or our service. So it just allows us to continue to make sound decisions for both the customers and for IPO. That requirement's always been there. This is just kind of clarifying that a little bit. Yes, sir. Yeah. 
the requirement to go underground, um, I would have to look that up, sir. It, it was a it was a few. The complaints answer is yes, because we blindly would require people to go underground whether it made sense or not there for a while. And so under Jim Nail, he's been looking at that and with and it, the current policy gives him discretion to say, hey, we'll allow this to remain above ground or for that installation to remain above ground. Uh, because again, if your whole neighborhood's above ground and your service, you're moving your service requirement, there's an accident or something happens, it doesn't make sense to force that person to pay a bunch of money to, to underground when everybody else is above ground. So IPL pays for the, the trenching to move it underground? No, no. That's always been a charge to the customer. And that's why it's an expensive endeavor to go from above ground to underground, or it could be, depending upon how far the service entrances from from the pole attachment. Wasn't at one point, wasn't there a program in place where we um, provided an incentive to go underground or we helped go underground or something to that effect? Yes, we did, but behind that was tied some, I'm sorry, yes, we did, but behind that was tied some FEMA uh, monies that allowed us to offset those costs. Well, that money has gone away years ago. And so we put actually a hold on that until we figure out what the actual costs are. Um, we were told and we were just um, talked with some electric contractors. Right now they're charging about 55 to $60 a running foot to bore somebody's yard. So you put in about 100 feet, that's over $6,000 just to put a bore in, no wire, nothing else. So this is the reason why we went to review this because it's the cost that we're coming to these people is getting to be rather high. I'll get those answers to you, sir. Uh, just to follow up on that question, was there ever any grant money? I mean, we, do we have a full-time grant writer at IPL? No, sir. Okay. At one time, I think we did, and there was grant money that came in. Did that help offset some of the costs of the rate payers on these things? It, it did, as he was talking, the FEMA right. money that came but through. But we don't have an active grant writer. We don't have right an active now. grant writer on staff right now. Do we right have now. plans to obtain one? Uh, not that I'm aware of, but I know there are uh, grants that are being looked at uh, citywide, and IPL is a part of those discussions, especially with a lot of the stuff that's been passed lately through the infrastructure bills. Yeah, there's there's quite a bit of money that's come in from the infrastructure bills, as well as there's money out there that we should be looking for. Mr. Mayor, we are using a company called Grant Scribe. Uh, that's helping uh, track and monitor all the different grant funds out there and apply um, uh, to be competitive for those. Okay, thank you. And then the last and final was just kind of a overall administrative cleanup of, uh, of the procedure. So looking at language, uh, verbiage, general administration of page numbers, table of contents, and making sure that page numbers and the table of contents matched where things were. Uh, that's really the big overall. I know it was 35 pages and uh, like I said, there was a lot. If you looked at the uh, audited version, there's a lot of lines and a lot of things crossed out and it was kind of hard to follow. But from a high level, that's really the major changes to this policy. Uh, so barring any other questions, I know that Mr. Stewart, maybe I have Council one, Member Stewart had a few. I have one question. All the other ones were answered. Um, so you said it was a thirty-five thousand dollars that we pay for these meter sockets. Is that right? For the socket, yes, sir. So we don't charge that back somehow to the customer. No, sir. It's just a straight-out loss of thirty-five thousand. Yes, sir. Okay. And, and that's the same story with the temporary meter installations as well. So. 
again, if we, right now, today, we go install a temporary meter connection at a construction site for a new neighborhood, and they call us three days later and, oh, our drywall guy backed over it, we go out and we replace it for free at cost to IPL. So the other thought behind that is if the contractors are supplying that, there's going to be a little more care to take care of that stuff as well. Okay, now we'll come and, and inspect and make sure it's safely hooked up and, and energize it, um, which is part of our continued service. But as far as providing the actual hardware, uh, we'd like to change that. Okay, thank you. Are all the meter sockets the same, like the holes in the back that drill into the house? I mean, are, is there going to be some sockets, uh, meter socket boxes that are different than like the standard mill bank, like what we're used to buying? There's been different ones through time. Um, I know that we're going to provide a list of actual uh, catalog numbers and ones that will be acceptable for installation. Uh, with this change, because I'm 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 reading through, I, I read through. I, this is pretty. This is a lot. Uh, I mean, this is with with everything in this document is like 45 pages. That that's a yes, couple sir. pages and all that. And I was looking through it, and and I I was curious. I'm the I have a residence. I put the meter socket on there, and and. You come out and put the actual meter on the box. Yes. Do you own it at that point? Because I can't, I can't break the seal. I can't take it off. If there's something goes wrong, who owns that? Who owns the meter socket? Yeah. Well, you put a meter on it, Me and if I own the box and you put the meter on it, but I can't break the seal, I can't do anything to it. Does IPL own it, or does the resident own it? Well, the resident owns it uh, even today when I when I go and deliver it. And it gets installed. Right. But that's part of the resident's house. But I can't touch it. Once that meter's in there, that's That is it. correct. I mean, like if there's then there's adapters for like a, a home generator. If you want to run a home generator out there and you could you can put a sleeve on it. I can't break that. I can't do I can't break that seal. Correct. So my question is, does IPL own that whole component or mm -hmm. or do I still own the box, you still own the meter, but I can't do anything? So something internally fails. IPL own that or? Okay, so if the meter socket fails, you're mm -hmm. saying, then that would be on the owner because the owner owns that portion. Okay. We own the meter. Okay. Because um, I asked that question to a couple PUAB members who, who, now they, both of them said they were pretty confused reading through it. Okay. Um, they only got like 72 hours to review it, which isn't a lot of time. Um, I'm wondering if, if there was be a way to let them come back, since they represent rate payers, and, and a lot of this, I mean, I'm a rate payer, and, I, I, and PUAB's there to represent my best interest. I'm wondering if there's a way that maybe we could go back to them and let them review it, ask questions that that pertain to rate pairs and where there's confusion that, that you could help them understand that better. I, I probably am not the person to make that decision if no, that's I, I the know that, wish of the council. I'm saying that to my colleagues. I'm okay. hoping that that would happen because they didn't feel like they had a good understanding of it and if you all would be available to, because uh, IPL is there to serve us. We're, we're always payers. available to answer questions, and, sir. And they should, they, they should get more than, especially on a large document that's there's a lot of industry language that's not ratepayer language. And if they have questions that they should be able to get good answers for the ratepayers, I think they should. Because I don't want to lower standards. I, I want to make sure our standards are high. We don't either. Well, and and, and some no, days none of this is going to lower service at all. Well, you know, we're, we're taking 35,000. Did we budget for that this year, the cans? Yes, because it's currently. But we're not going to use 35,000 to buy cans or do we have those those meter boxes this year i i am sure we have some in stock but i have no clue how many that we currently have in stock and i was just curious if we went ahead and did the thirty-five thousand in this year's budget for those yes it's, cur it's currently year. in the budget so are we going to buy those cans with that that budget money 
uh, not if the policy changes. Well, but that's what I'm asking. If, if it's in the budget this year, so does this policy change go into next year? Uh, that's another discussion topic would be when this policy would go into effect. Okay. And it's, I do not see it like a light switch that as soon as it's approved and signed that it would go into effect and we're no longer providing those things. We would need to communicate a timeline as well that would need to be agreed to. I, and that's, uh, so if we're, if, if this year's budget, because we're in this year's budget now, we're yes, in the new budget year. So is there 35,000, Mr. Walker, do you know if the answer to this, is there 35,000 set aside for the, the uh, meter sockets? I, I don't have that line item committed to memory. Okay, that's fine. Um, if we could find that out, that would be helpful. And are we gonna actually use 35,000 for the purchase of the meter sockets this year and go and have all this change over into next year? Because I, I don't know how many, do you know how many meter sockets we have available in the warehouse today? No, sir. Okay. I do not. All right. Well, if, if it's in the budget this year, and I would like to see us continue to do that for the residents this year, and then maybe we make that change next year, and we just eliminate that, that line item out of the budget, if, if possible. Does that make sense? If I'm hearing you correctly, kind Council of. Member, what you're asking them to do is withdraw their recommendation to have customers buy this and having the city continuing to pay for it for this uh, budget year, if I'm hearing you correctly. Well, we approve that budget, Mr. Mayor, and, and, and if that's in the budget, then I think that's something that we should provide through this year at least and then make the change next year. Right. My question was just only for clarification. Yes, and that's fine. That's, that's what I was doing. Any further questions? Any further questions? Mm -mm. Thank you very much, okay, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. That concludes the uh, electric service policy update. The next thing we have, boards and commissions. Mr. City Manager, could you run us through that process, please? Actually, sir, if it's okay, I'll defer to the city clerk. Um, okay. And then I think there's a few things we'll work back and forth on here. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so we've had some discussions here recently about merging and dissolving various boards and commissions. So. The first recommendation is merging three of the oversight committees, the Stormwater Control Oversight Committee, Street Improvement Oversight Committee, and Public Safety Tax Committee. Um, merging those into one super committee, if you will, that would take a look over those three, I guess four, sales tax and use tax funds. Um, if there's no objections, we have attached an example or a draft to the agenda, so if you've taken a look at that, that would be the proposed language for the next meeting. I, I did look at that language and a question comes to mind and that is, um, I was noticing that, well, I guess um, if either you or city manager, whoever wants to address this, maybe city manager, um, just review for me the appointing process, the process we go through to appoint um, board members and, and how that kind of, the history behind that and how that's worked over the years. And um, I think I know what we're doing now, but I kind of want a bigger picture. Yeah, um, you, do, do you want me? Currently, these are appointed by individual council appointment. Each of these committees has seven seats. So it's an individual council appointment. The recommended super committee, if you will, the local, I think we called it the local tax oversight committee. Um, that would also have <clears throat> seven individual council appointments. It would follow the same, the same line of thinking there. Okay, have we, have we always appointed, you know, um, things of that way? The, as far as I know, the sales tax committees have been this way. There's several charter committees, um, the Public Utility Advisory Board and the Planning Commission immediately come to mind. Um, in my tenure with the city, that's varied how those were filled out. Um, up until very recently, though, those were done um, by the body as a whole. Um, but about a year ago, uh, those uh, the council voted to change that process to individual appointments, um, created a lottery system, assigning each of the seven appointments to each of the seven members of the body. Um, and now we're handling those as individual appointments um, as kind of has been done with these sales tax committees. 
there was a, I'm, I'm going off of memory here, Madam City Clerk, but there was a council interview committee that would take applications, that would review those, do interviews, um, and then make a recommendation to the body um, uh, about who to appoint into those, um, those charter created groups. That's helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question on the, on just the language of these uh, different sales tax. Um, uh, I guess they would be referendums or whatever the voters voted on. Um, is there specific language that there's supposed to be specific oversight for that, for the monies collected from that? And if not, I, I mean, I would like to see that. Um, the way they were written and and to ensure that I've got <laughs> I had several calls on this today that there uh, people are concerned that we're getting a little uh, too centralized in our oversight that these tax issues that we they passed and the precious tax dollars that they've entrusted us with need to have civilian oversight that's part of it and I think that uh, I stand with that. I think that the more oversight we have with tax dollars, the better we are in terms of accountability and ethics for the way that we handle our business here. So the ordinances that, we, that we've passed, I think, have specific language to, to oversight committees. And I want to be real cautious in trying to centralize it down into one oversight group. Uh, Mr. Mayor, the uh, city attorney prepared a memo back on July 21st that I sent to the council on July 22nd, and I'm going to read from that. There is nothing in the city charter or otherwise that would prevent the city council from combining these oversight committees into one. My recommendation is to officially dissolve and or combine through an ordinance and vote by the city council. I would just I would just add that our city attorney doesn't represent districts, and when people are concerned about oversight, that we need to lend an ear to them. And, and um, I think for me, I think if we're going to err on any uh, side, we're going to err on the side of taxpayers. And so, giving, allowing for committees to give specific oversight for particular tax um, issues. Is, is a wise thing. That's all I have So to say. am I correct in understanding that this doesn't decrease the oversight at all? This just combines the committees so that there's one committee instead of three committees. Correct. Um, and as this, the city clerk could better state than I, but you know, each of these committees having seven individual um, members on, on those. Uh, for these three committees, you're talking about trying to find 21 citizens to fill those out. It gets very difficult. Um, sometimes we have committees that are unable to meet for lack of a quorum. Um, we also hear from some of the committees that, you know, these departments um, coordinate a lot together. So kind of seeing the larger macro picture instead of looking at it at the granular level would be helpful to get a better sense of how these funds are being spent. Right. So, I, I mean, that's what my understanding, the way I read this was that it would create hopefully create some efficiency in the in the corp I mean in the committee structure I mean I know when I was on the public safety tax oversight committee there were a number of times that we um, only had you know the minimum number of people to um, to have a, a quorum to have a committee meeting and um, and and, uh, and for quite some time we had vacancies on the committee, um, and so you know when you take 21 down to seven, that that helps that process at least to a degree. So, okay, thank you. I um, I don't know. I don't like the idea of combining them. Uh, in these meetings, you have a lot of you know city personnel. You have the chief of police. You have the director of municipal service and they come in and you know they give updates and answer questions and I think it's going to be a lot of extra work for seven people um, to you know have to should be a lot of extra information that I think is not going to work for them I mean there's gonna be so much to take in I mean are they going to be able to get through it all 
how long are the meetings going to be? And how long are they going to take? I mean, they're going to take forever. Um, I'm not sure. I just think all the extra work would be make it difficult. Proceed, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. So I was reviewing this as, as well. So my thought would be, um, as a quick takeaway, maybe divide them out from public safety to our regular capital improvement projects as a thought to help. My thought being that the public safety is a little bit more unique with, with its um, um, just, just being a different animal altogether compared to our stormwater and some of the other tests. So just break it into, rather than three down to one, three down to two, if I'm hearing you correctly. Well, just have the, the public safety oversight is one, then, then the, the others as one. And then so the others that are, public safety stays the same, correct. if I'm hearing you correctly, and then combine the others together. Correct. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Councilmember, I can tell you're pondering, and just you just had that I mean, look I, like I, I like wanted that to say something. Better. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wanted to give you the chance if you need. If you wanted no, to. I like that better. Thank you. So you you might consider that as an option rather than going from three to two, one to three to two. My concern is just overworking the committee. That's my main concern, and that stuff gets lost in the cracks. You know, that that's my concern. Okay. That they'll just, you know, I don't want to accuse anybody, but they'll just. There'll be so much information that maybe all the research won't get done. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? If any uh, further information from you, Madam City Clerk? No, so do we want a revision and just come back at another study session? I know Councilmember Steinmeier, you said you wanted to look at the foundational documentation for the oversight committee, so we can just bring it back to another study session. I don't think there's any rush unless I'm mistaken Mr. City Manager no this was um, really a byproduct of the council's um, strategic planning session back on June the 21st um, so we made that proposal but there is no priority about this Councilmember, would that would that satisfy your request that would be much appreciated thank you happy to do it anyone else other further questions comments concerns so we have one more recommendation, and that's to dissolve the Transportation Policy Committee. Okay. So we discussed this previously at the last study session. Um, there's not a whole lot more to add to it. We have added a draft resolution to this agenda, if you've taken a look at that. Any comments on dissolving the Transportation Policy Committee? You know, we have a lot of bus riders in the city, and um, a lot of them live in my district. You know, I've heard from at least one of them, and you know he doesn't like the idea of this. Um, I don't know. Just, um, I mean, how often is the transportation committee meeting now anyway? And like, what are we? They really do. What are we? Um, what's the agenda at this point? They haven't met for I'd say probably a few years now. So it's been a, it's been a while. Yeah, I mean, I think easily before the pandemic started. I guess my concern if we did need something from one that, that it would be gone. But okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Any other further discussions, comments, questions? Mr. City Manager, anything to wrap up? Nothing further from me. Okay. Nothing further. And I don't see uh, there's no other discussion topics that I'm aware of. So with that, I'm going to declare us to adjourn. Thank you.